Okay, so uh, my idea was to talk about uh, it's it's rather general uh, titled "60 Years in Space." Of course, it's uh, about 60 years since uh, the, the flight of Yuri Gagarin uh, in April 1961, uh, and what next? Uh, so it covers nearly everything. But my, uh, my I didn't want to talk about my own experience without talking about the past, because we say often in the ESA and NASA language that. Uh, uh, we are on the shoulder of giants, and there is no doubt that uh, the success of the shuttle program was based on the success of the Apollo program. Apollo was an unbelievable achievement by NASA and the uh, the Americans in general, with a lot of participation of the of the industry, of course, and uh, and academia. Uh, it was an unbelievable success, and uh, after that, uh, NASA decided to develop a reusable spacecraft to exploit the capabilities of, uh, of low Earth orbit, uh, the space shuttle. And I was uh, involved in the space shuttle as uh, uh, Lucas mentioned, I uh, was there for quite a while, uh, 25 years in Houston with my family as an ESA astronaut and flew four times in space. But I also wanted to talk about the, the, the next step because there are a lot of things happening now, despite the pandemic situation, uh, space activities, whether it's manned or unmanned are extremely active. When you think about uh, this year, we have uh, three spacecraft on their way to uh, planet Mars, one from the US, uh, one from China, one from the, uh, the Emirates that was launched in, uh, in Japan. Uh, we just got back samples from an asteroid. Uh, we have samples from the moon that are returning with a Chinese spacecraft uh, back to China. And of course, in, in the area of a human spaceflight, we have uh, a very active International Space Station program. And recently we had two missions of um, the Crew Dragon capsule uh, built, designed, designed and built and operated by SpaceX that uh, uh, joined the International Space Station on a test flight in the spring with two astronauts and uh, recently about three weeks ago with uh, four astronauts to ISS. So it's really active and we have in preparation a moon, a moon program and I will talk about that. So that's the what next. Uh, I'll talk about the past, about my activities, what is happening now and about the future. So it's a pretty big program and I will have to go relatively rapidly through these phases, but space is extremely uh, alive and, and active and it's very, it's very, very satisfying to see how alive space is at a period of time when uh, a lot of people are uh, rather depressed and uh, the economy is not good. The airlines are in a really bad situation, but space is very alive. All right, interesting. Now I cannot go through my slides. So let me stop share for a while. Hold on, hold on one second. Let me try something else here. Hmm. Cannot go through my slides. Let me do this. Ah, it works now. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, what I will talk about. Uh, why we go into space, that's going to be very brief because you all know why we go into space, but I will summarize for the one of you who are not too familiar with familiar with space activities. I'll have a, one slide only, honor to Gagarin, talk about Apollo, the post-Apollo post programs, including shuttle, Hubble, and ISS, new actors, new destination, new spirits, back to the moon, and a crazy and smart idea. This is what uh, happened a couple of days ago, maybe some of you have seen that, but uh, that was absolutely amazing. I talk about uh, the starship of uh, SpaceX. Okay, uh, why are we going to space? <laughs> and again, I summarize here because most of you know that very well, but we go to space because it is useful. This is a view of planet Earth and you see a hurricane in the Pacific. This is the west coast of the United States. And obviously observing the Earth and the weather phenomena from uh, space is extremely useful. You know, you can predict the path of these hurricanes and uh, evacuate uh, population from uh, the Philippines somewhere here, uh, or in the Atlantic, it's the Caribbean, whenever these uh, very dangerous weather phenomena are threatening. And 
all in all, it allows us to have a weather good weather forecast and to monitor the changing climates. And uh, also, I give an example when we had these uh, vegetation fires in Australia in December 2019, we could very well for space uh, monitor the motion of all of these uh, clouds of ashes all the way to South America, to the southern tip of South America, thanks to the space system. So we go to space because it is useful. Uh, another useful aspect apart from Earth observation and uh, uh, monitoring of the weather phenomena is uh, precise navigation, GPS and the Galileo, which is a European GPS, and of course for communication also. It is also space, a unique platform for science and exploration. And this is a picture uh, taken during Apollo 17, the last mission of the Apollo program in December 1972, and you have an astronaut on the left-hand side, Harrison Schmidt, a geologist. He really would like to take this stone back to Earth, but it was a little bit too big, so he took some samples of it. But anyway, we, we've learned a lot about, uh, about uh, the Earth, about the Sun, about the solar system, about the universe, uh, thanks to the opportunity to go into space and have a perfect view of these celestial bodies. So again, to summarize, we go to space because it is useful and because it is a wonderful platform for science and exploration. Space is also fun. I just so show this picture. It's one example of uh, the fun aspects of space. You know, one of my fellow astronauts, American astronaut, Don Pettit, he's drinking tea with chopsticks. Uh, and this is, this is really fun. He prepared tea in this uh, plastic container here. He pressed the plastic container, so he produced a big ball of a tea at the end of this tube. Then he brought the chopsticks, and the chopsticks have more area than the end of this tube. So the, the tea ball chose to stick to the chopsticks, and he can bring this uh, ball of tea attached to the chopstick to his mouth. So <laughs> drinking tea with chopsticks. So space is fun also. It's really useful, wonderful platform for science exploration, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's always a huge inspiration. When uh, this book was published, On a marché sur la lune, I was uh, 10 years of age, 1954. And this is for me a huge inspiration. It's a very good representation of the moon also with a sea of tranquility here, the sea of crisis here, uh, the sea of serenity here. So Hergé, the author of On a marché sur la lune, uh, did a very good job representing the moon and the uh, the sky full of stars. This was for me, honestly, I was 10 years of age, a huge inspiration. Now, honor to Gagarin, as mentioned, uh, next year in April, we'll have the 60th anniversary of uh, Yuri Gagarin's flight. Yuri Gagarin is always very, very much respected by all astronauts and cosmonauts. Um, uh, he opened the doors of space for many of us. Now, of course, uh, the response of the American with the Apollo program, and uh, this is a beautiful picture of uh, the Earth seen from the distance of about 400,000 kilometers. Uh, imagine you are on orbit around the moon and you see the Earth uh, <clears throat> with this crescent of the Earth slowly rising at the horizon of the moon. It's really beautiful. And the, the Apollo program and uh, uh, <coughs> Lucas can say a lot about this uh, is a absolutely superb program and there are so many wonderful lessons uh, not only technical lessons but lessons about how to conduct the program and have success um, with a, a streamlined way of uh, facing adversity of uh, uh, <clears throat> managing risk at a very high level really it was a it was a wonderful program okay I lost the, the possibility of uh, switching from one slide to the next. So I'm going to have to stop. Excuse me, but I have to stop share again. Okay, it works now. Uh, this is the Apollo 11 liftoff. I, I like this picture because you see, this is really the 60s. You see the vehicle of the 60s. People are very very enthusiastic with the American flags. And this is Saturn V rocket, a huge rocket with uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins uh, on this little capsule on top of this gigantic rocket. 
a very emotional moment, so the liftoff on the 16th of um, July, 1969, Apollo 11 Saturn V rocket taking three people to the moon. And uh, these are the crew members and, you know, just a reminder, uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, Buzz Aldrin, the two who walked on the moon, and uh, Mike Collins, who stayed in the command module on orbit around the moon, waiting for his two colleagues to join him uh, so that the three of them went back uh, to Earth inside the Apollo uh, command module. And uh, this is going to be the first step of uh, Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon. There was a camera outside uh, recording uh, the descent of Neil Armstrong from the ladder of the Eagle lunar module. The lunar module was named Eagle. And he is going to set foot on the moon. But in fact, he was not the first one because uh, uh, Tata and Milou and Capitaine Haddock and uh, Tournesol, uh, thanks to Ona Marche sur la Lune from uh, Hergé, had been on the moon before with a beautiful rocket with the white and red circles. <laughs> That's a very nice cartoon of um, Neil Armstrong realizing that he's not the first one on the moon. That's nice. He looks the starship. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I'll come back to that a little later. Um, that's a very well-known picture of um, the lunar module Eagle on the surface of the moon. And this is a Buzz Aldrin picture taken by Neil Armstrong. And this is a famous experiment, uh, <clears throat> solar wind uh, collection experiment from the University of, of, of Bern. So the Swiss are very proud that they had uh, one of the only scientific American taken on this uh, first uh, Landing on the moon, it was taken again on the, on the later Apollo missions. But that's a very nice picture. And you see this unbelievable landscape, totally uh, dry, no atmosphere, black sky, with the sun, which is pretty low over the horizon on the left-hand side here. They landed shortly after sunrise on the surface of the moon in order to have a better visibility of the topography of the moon and, and manage the landing of the lunar module Eagle. Beautiful picture, a lot of emotion. Now, of course, it continued with Apollo 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 was the last one uh, in December 1972. And I just have a picture because it's another aspect of, uh, of uh, having fun uh, in space. And uh, you see the commander, Gene Cernan, uh, who has found a new way of uh, moving uh, on the moon, not just walking, but skipping on the moon. Uh, Paula, when you do this and you go down slope, that first step is a long one. I'm having This is the best way for me to travel, uphill or downhill. What's that? Like this, two-legged hop. Or seen, you know, and on level ground, I can skip. I don't like that loping thing. Oh, the loping's the only way to go. <laughs> See, when I'm on level ground, I can skip. <laughs> I love this video. And you know, this shows, it's another example of uh, uh, human spaceflight is something that is very rigorous, very serious. Uh, you need a lot of focus and attention, a lot of training, but at the same time, it's a lot of fun. So I think uh, uh, the picture of drinking tea with chopstick that I showed before on this picture, many others uh, show this. Uh, okay, let me talk about Lucas now. Uh, Lucas has been introduced already before briefly, but uh, this is uh, Lucas in the cockpit of Airbus uh, 320. He's a commander, Airbus commander at Swiss. And uh, as mentioned before, he's a president of Swiss Apollo, this organization. Um, and uh, he, he does this together with, uh, with Bettina, his wife, and uh, Francois Keller, who is here. Um, and uh, he established this very precious link between uh, Switzerland and the Apollo actors, not only the astronauts, the ones who are still alive, unfortunately, uh, a number of them uh, are no longer with us. Uh, they are all, of course, in their, in their late 70s or 80s, and they are not uh, young people, even Buzz Aldrin is 90 years of age. Uh, but he has kept this uh, link with the actors of Apollo, astronauts, uh, flight directors, flight controllers, engineers, and this is very precious. And we are very grateful to Lucas that he has brought the spirit of Apollo 
in Switzerland and in Europe in general. And he wrote an excellent book uh, that I will show on the next slide. And you can get this book from this uh, website here, the Swiss Apollo website. This is the book, Apollo Confidential. Uh, he has had a very close contact with a number of Apollo astronauts, and he has a lot of personal stories that he's narrating in his uh, book. It was published in the French language initially, and uh, more recently published in English language. I recommend it very highly. It's an excellent book. With references from uh, uh, Charlie Duke, who wrote the preface of this book, and also Le Monde. Uh, it's a very, very, very good book. Highly recommend it. Okay, let's, uh, of course, I, I summarize the Apollo program. There, there's so much to, to say about Apollo. You can have um, Lucas Villetti give you not only one session, but a full course on the Apollo program. But uh, I will talk about other things now, but again, Apollo was a, was a bright light in the constellation of the human spaceflight history. Um, at the end of the Apollo program, the American decided to go ahead with um, uh, the development of the space shuttle. It was bringing wings on orbit, the idea being to have a reusable spacecraft that at the end of the mission was landing on a runway at Kennedy Space Center or sometimes at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And uh, the um, space shuttle program allowed two other great programs, the Hubble Space Telescope, and I will talk about it in a few minutes, and the International Space Station that was assembled mainly uh, in about 30 missions with pieces that were brought from uh, the surface of the Earth to space with the space shuttle, except the Russian segment was uh, uh, assembled with components that were brought with a, with a proton rocket uh, lifting off from Russia. Now the space shuttle, that's a space shuttle at liftoff. Uh, you see the so-called orbiter uh, with a large cargo bay, about 16 meters uh, long, five meters in diameter, the cabin for seven people. Uh, <clears throat> here we have 300 engine using the content of this big tank, 700 tons of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen for the only eight and a half minute ascent to orbit. So the ascent to orbit was really short. Space is very close, you know, and eight and a half minutes was enough in duration from the liftoff until we reach so-called main engine cutoff but the thrust of these three engines was not enough to lift off the assembly. So we needed two solid rocket boosters that were uh, entirely consumed after two minutes. They were separated from the tank, fell down in the ocean, were recovered by boats. So the only part that uh, reached space was the orbiter. The external tank after main engine cutoff was separated and was falling down in the Pacific Ocean about 45 minutes after main engine cutoff. That the space shuttle. Uh, we had 30 years of operation of the space shuttle from the first flight in 1981. Uh, by the way, STS-1 was also the 12th of April 1981, exactly 20 years after the flight of Yuri Gagarin. And it was operated until 2011, so for 30 years, total 135 missions. Unfortunately, only 133 landings because we lost Challenger in uh, 1986 and Columbia in 2003. So the shuttle was a very uh, efficient vehicle. It allowed to do a lot of things on low Earth orbit, uh, very flexible uh, utilization. It could take a very large cargo and seven people. But one of the dark side of uh, the shuttle is, is that it was relatively dangerous. To have two losses out of 135 flights was not a very good record. It was also rather expensive to operate. And uh, this is the shuttle on orbit, a nice, uh, nice view taken from a satellite that had been deployed from the cargo bay of the shuttle. And the shuttle then separated from uh, this uh, small satellite. Satellite was equipped with a camera, uh, camera with film, not the digital camera. Uh, and uh, the astronaut commanded the camera and took a selfie of themselves and of their spaceship uh, by commanding this camera there to recover the satellite, to recover the camera and the film. But it's a nice camera. You have to imagine that the velocity vector is inside the screen. So it's like an airplane flying with 90 degrees angle of attack, followed a few hundred meters behind by this satellite with the camera. Nice view. Completely black sky during the day when the sun is above the horizon one hour per orbit, one orbit is an hour and a half. And you have one hour day with the sun above the horizon and uh, half an hour night, then uh, an hour day, half an hour night. So 16 times 
per day, you have one orbit around the Earth. So when you are orbit working, let's say for 12, 13 hours per day in the flight plan, you go eight times around the Earth and it's day, night, day, night, day, night, which uh, I must say was kind of fun. I like the idea of uh, having the constant change uh, from day to night and night to day. Um, this is a wonderful view. I like it. Uh, this was a workplace during the typically 10 or 12 days of a, of a shuttle mission. This is the flight deck. We also had the mid deck below the flight deck. So that was about half the habitable volume for seven people. And you see pretty much the geometry of the cockpit of, a, of an airliner with a seat of the commander on the left hand side and the co pilot on the right hand side. A rotational hand controller for both of them, translation hand controller here. Basically, when you have a spaceship on orbit, you have six degrees of freedom. You have three degrees of freedom rotation, pitch, yaw, and roll. And you have three degrees of freedom translation, X, Y, and Z. So you command these with the rotation and translation hand controllers. But you see the cockpit is very complex. It was a cockpit of uh, the 70s design, the first flight of a the shuttle, as mentioned, was in 1981, and the first test atmospheric tests were in 1977-78. So that's a cockpit of the 70s with a lot of switches. In modern cockpit, and uh, Lucas Villetti knows that quite well because he flies a very modern airplane. We have very few switches now. Uh, this was a modification to, that was done to the shuttle in 1999 or 2000. It, uh, a glass cockpit. The original cockpit of the space shuttle had electromechanical instrument like the old uh, 747s or DC-10s. But anyway, that uh, shuttle forward flight deck. And imagine you turn 180 degrees, and that's the difference with, a, with an airliner. You have a, the aft cockpit, full of switches again, 1970s style, rotational hand controller for the shuttle, translation hand controller. Uh, and this is for the robotic arm, the rotation hand controller, translation hand controller. And typically when we were getting close to Hubble for the capture of Hubble, which uh, happened to me two times on a mission in 93 and in 99, the commander was here flying the shuttle and uh, approaching the targets, which was the Hubble Space Telescope in the proper uh, position and uh, distance. And at some point there was a handover to the robotic arm operator who was uh, commanding the arm in rotation with the rotation hand controller translation here uh, to grapple the telescope and install it in the payload bay. So uh, I'm quite familiar with this part, especially the right hand part of this uh, aft flight deck, because that was my workstation uh, on two occasions at school. That brings back memories for me and wonderful memories. Hey, this is where you are, the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> this is a nice view of the Earth. You see the, the Mediterranean Sea. You see uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Athens in uh, Greece here. You see Italy. You see Switzerland. And uh, you see North Africa. Uh, uh, a slightly retouched view of uh, the Mediterranean nations on this picture. Uh, the views of uh, the Earth are, of course, absolutely wonderful. The views of uh, the sky at night after sunset and until sunrise for about 10 minutes 10 minute each night, are absolutely superb. Now, um, as mentioned, I had the opportunity to fly four missions. I won't describe them in detail, of course, but that's one, two, three, four. Uh, and you see the duration is always about uh, 10 days, plus or minus uh, two, three days. The longest was the third mission that I flew with Mauricio Kelly, who was with us before, uh, was a, a two weeks mission. That's about the maximum we could get with a space shuttle. And these two mission, number two and number four, were uh, visits of the Hubble Space Telescope to do repair uh, and maintenance and exchange of instrument. Now that's my first flight, <laughs> STS-46 in the summer of 1992. We had uh, on one hand to deploy a European retrieval carrier, which is a scientific platform of the European Space Agency. And then we tested the um, so-called tethered satellite, the satellite at the end of a, of a leech, pretty much like a dog, uh, electrically conducting leech. And um, <clears throat> well, you in Italy know that very well because this, that was an Italian idea. That's the reason why we had Franco Malerba here, the first Italian astronaut. Uh, Maurizio Kelly flew on the second flight of the tethered satellite uh, about four years later. 
but the idea was to test the capability to generate electrical power uh, with the induction effect. If you move rapidly a uh, electrical conductor in a magnetic field, you generate a voltage and uh, you can generate a current if you can close the circuit via the ionosphere. But anyway, we did that. It didn't work too well the first time. That's why we did it again four years later on STS-75. Rowan Scheiber, the commander, and that's uh, Marsha Ivins, a woman American astronaut with long hair, and uh, this picture was definitely taken in space, not in the simulator, but in space. First mission, first uh, exposure to the space environment and a wonderful experience. Now, uh, <laughs> I show this picture taken on this first flight here. By the way, you see the old cockpit of the space shuttle that was with the electromechanical instrument. And uh, you see the switches uh, all over, including on the ceiling. And uh, these are two of my fellow crew members I knew very well my six fellow crew members because we were seven total but i cannot identify who uh, who they are here observing the earth through the front windows of the cockpit but you see the feet are very close to these switches and uh, each of these switches on the ceiling but also everywhere uh, are guarded uh, with metal loops to avoid the change the position of a switch uh, inadvertently with your feet on the ceiling for instance that's a characteristics of all the human uh, space machines. It was the case in the lunar module also, for instance. Now, uh, this mission went pretty well for Eureka, a little less well with the tethered satellite. At some point, we had a problem with a with a so-called waste collection system of the toilet. That is the toilet in the space shuttle, pretty much like a toilet in a, on Earth, but uh, there is a way to uh, attach your body to the, to the cuvette here. Uh, there's like a, a strap-on system. It's necessary to do that. And you have procedures here that you have to follow in order to do the right thing. And uh, uh, we had problems with the toilet. So of course, as I was a rookie on this flight, a rookie means somebody who does the first flight. Uh, if there's problem with the toilet, it's of course not the commander who will fix it, it's the rookie. So I said, I'm going to try to fix it. And I took the in-flight maintenance book here and I put the mask pretty much like uh, we have the COVID mask these days and goggles and, uh, and I fixed the toilet and uh, it worked. Uh, this may be the reason why NASA gave me three other uh, shuttle missions in, in the 90s because on my first flight, I was able to fix the toilet. Anyway, uh, enough of the, this first mission and uh, that was also an introduction to the third one which had a similar goal but with much better success with the tethered satellite. I'll talk about Hubble now. Uh, I had been an astronomer before becoming an astronaut in addition to being a pilot. And uh, if you are an astronomer and uh, uh, you are asked to go and uh, do repair work on the Hubble Space Telescope, this is really a dream mission. And I was very fortunate to be selected on the first servicing mission of Hubble. It's basically a telescope uh, project that uh, is joined uh, by NASA and the European Space Agency with a large contribution by NASA, about 85% and 15% ESA, on orbit around the Earth. So of course, it's an ideal position to look at celestial objects and have very clear pictures and spectra of these objects because you don't have the atmosphere between the telescope and the object that you are studying. It's on orbit at 600 kilometers altitude, 28 degree inclination, which happens to be the um, latitude of Kennedy Space Center, the launch site. Now the satellite, excuse me, the telescope was deployed on its orbit uh, on mission number 31 of the space shuttle in the spring of 1990. And uh, that's a view taken from a camera at the back of the payload bay. The telescope was filling the whole payload bay uh, of course, the solar arrays were folded. And uh, once a uh, robot arm had deployed Hubble, the cylinder, cylindrical structure, uh, the solar arrays were uh, unfolded, uh, oriented to the sun to charge the batteries. And now you see that we just had the release of Hubble, uh, which is now flying formation with the shuttle at 28,000 kilometers an hour, quite impressive. But of course, what is important is the relative motion, not the absolute motion. Now, unfortunately, and uh, I had this in the text, that we, there was an undetected problem, which was a, a wrong shape of the primary mirror of the telescope. Uh, a mirror telescope is a primary mirror, a secondary mirror, then it has scientific instrument behind the primary mirror. 
but the primary mirror had a very small error, small mechanical error, but optically speaking, it was not acceptable. Uh, this was only detected after deployment of the telescope. So, uh, of course, it was necessary to go and fix it. And uh, we had a grand total of uh, five servicing missions of uh, Hubble between December 93, and I was part of that one. And uh, the last one was in uh, May of 2009. Uh, and uh, on this last mission, May 2009, uh, a lot of was done to keep the telescope alive for as long as possible. It's still working fine now, 11 years after that last servicing mission. But I was privileged to be part of the first servicing mission, uh, and I was really happy to be part of the, that team. So we trained for one year between end of 92 until uh, December uh, 93. And uh, three days before liftoff, we went with T-38s to Kennedy Space Center, the whole crew of seven crew members, and uh, we spent the last three nights there. And I remember at uh, um, about uh, 1.30 in the morning, 2nd of December, 1993, we were brought with a little bus to the launch, launch pad. And I can tell you, this is a very emotional moment. So when you open the door of that little bus and you see your spaceship, uh, ready for, for liftoff with a payload bay filled with instruments who are going to exchange on Hubble, especially the optical corrector, that was very important. And I remember vividly this very special moment. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's a mix of feeling. At the same time, you are a little bit worried because the uh, ascent to space is pretty dangerous, but especially you feel an enormous responsibility because uh, they gave you this mission. Uh, it's pretty dangerous, it's um, expensive, and people count on you to do a good job, and uh, it's quite a quite a lot of load on your shoulders. Uh, at the same time, it's the beginning of a of a great adventure. Uh, we go up with an elevator to that level, then with the bridge to the white room where we do the last preparation before getting into the cabin. Here, the seven crew members, with the feet up, of course, we are not sitting like you are sitting in front of your computers, and I am also now. Uh, we are 90 degrees off with the feet up. Lift off at 4.26 in the morning uh, with the goal to meet with the Hubble Space Telescope on orbit at 600 kilometers altitude uh, two days after liftoff or 48 hours after liftoff. And uh, here we are, that's an artist view representing the position of the space shuttle commanded by the commander uh, in the aft cockpit here facing the payload bay and I was a robot arm operator. And at some point, as mentioned, there was a transition from the control of the shuttle to control of the robot arm. You don't want to com command both at the same time. It's one or the other. And uh, here I'm at the uh, control of the robotic arm, translation on the left hand and rotation over the right hand, ready to capture Hubble and install it in a small platform in the back of the payload bay here. And here we are. This is with the old solar array. This is with the new solar array that were installed later, but these are the old solar array provided by British Aerospace, so that is one of the European contribution to the telescope project. That's a small platform. That's a pretty big telescope, about uh, 15 meters high, four and a half meter diameter here, uh, quite a large telescope. Solar arrays, you see, they're not in very good shape. We had new folded solar arrays here in the payload bay. We were going to exchange them on the last uh, uh, spacewalk. We had a plan for five spacewalks on this mission. You see the Earth upside down, 600 kilometers below us. This is Madagascar. And that was an important uh, step in this repair, the installation of uh, the optical corrector. Uh, we had uh, opened the payload bay doors in the bottom of the telescope, in the instrument part of the telescope. and. Uh, I'm commanding the robot arm. This is Katie Thornton, that's Tom Akers, two of my fellow crew members, and uh, Katie took the um, optical corrector from a thermostabilized container in the payload bay, and I'm going to bring her uh, to install it inside the uh, instrument compartment of uh, the telescope. Now, this worked fine, and we did some other work. Uh, we replaced batteries, uh, gyroscopes, uh, uh, we added memory to the onboard computer of Hubble. On the last um, spacewalk, we exchanged the solar arrays. Uh, this is a new solar array, but not yet unfolded. And this is a uh, story, Musgrave and Jeff Hoffman, two of my fellow crew members, 
uh, you see the story has the tools at the end of the robot arm and uh, for each spacewalk we had to take a certain number of tools to do the, the job on the telescope. We had a lot of training before. We did a lot of training in the water to simulate the weightlessness conditions. But that's a beautiful picture. We are above Australia. You see here Adelaide, the south of Australia. This is Antarctica in the background and the black sky. Beautiful environment. What a workplace. Very desirable workplace. And uh, <clears throat> you see the life support system for each space walker. Uh, give him or her for about uh, eight and a half hours of uh, time outside. Uh, it's limited with the oxygen available and also the electrical power. And uh, we had total success on this mission. Uh, th that was kind of unexpected because it was the first time we were doing major repair work on a complex scientific instrument in the space environment and we expected many more problems than we had. We had a few, but we could all uh, bypass them and uh, still accomplish the goal. You see the telescope still with uh, uh, attached to us with the new solar arrays. Uh, Dick Cavi, the commander, Jeff Hoffman, Ken Bowersox, Tom Akers, Katie Thornton, Story Masgrave, and myself. Uh, happy faces. We still didn't know if the optical corrector was working. Uh, all the rest we could verify on the spot and the ground and also verification with telemetry but we had to wait a couple of weeks until the telescope was pointed to stars uh, commanded uh, from a ground station in Greenbelt, Maryland. And uh, then uh, it was uh, found out that uh, the optical correction was fine. It was uh, exactly as expected. So big success on this first servicing mission. We had another one that I would not part of in uh, uh, <clears throat> 1996. And there was a third one planned at the end of 99. And I was happy to be again selected uh, for another visit to Hubble. Uh, I was so happy because again, as an astronomer working on Hubble was the best possible activity I could imagine uh, for a space mission. And uh, you see here training in the water, the, that uh, very um, high fidelity model of Hubble with these doors that I was talking about uh, before that we could open in the instrument section of the telescope to exchange scientific instrument or the gyroscopes. And this time we had a problem with Hubble with the gyroscope. They were necessary to uh, allow precise pointing of the telescope. And um, four out of the six gyroscopes that were on Hubble were uh, not working anymore. They had failed and we wanted to change all six of them. In addition, we had to change the main computer of Hubble and one of the pointing cameras. Training in the water, and that's me. This time I was one of the space walkers and we could go inside the telescope with the spacesuit, as you can see here. Uh, we lifted off on the 19th of December, 1999, shortly before Christmas. And uh, here we are uh, again above uh, Australia, 600 kilometers altitude. The telescope is again on that platform at the end of the payload bay. I'm here at the end of the robot arm and I had removed the old pointing camera, so-called fine guidance sensor. That's the old one that I put temporarily on the side of the fuselage. I'm inserting the new one in the telescope, perpendicular to the optical axis of the telescope. And that's Mike Fole, my colleague. You see the large size of the telescope, really huge instrument. And uh, that's a picture at the end of this uh, spacewalk. It lasted about um, uh, eight hours and 10 minutes, so it was pretty long. And uh, you see all the tools that we had at the end of the robot arm. All the tools were attached with a safety tether of course, astronauts are attached with safety tethers also. Uh, and you see uh, the visor and the, the, the lights that uh, allow you to work during the orbital nights. So we worked eight, and, eight hours and 10 minutes, so we went five times around the, around the Earth. So it was day, night, day, night, day, night. And during the night, you illuminate the place of work with these floodlights so you can continue to work. I took some pictures with a Nikon camera at the end of the spacewalk. And on Christmas Day, we released Hubble, 25th of December, 1999. It was repaired, it was working fine. That's the satisfaction of this Hubble servicing mission. You meet with the telescope uh, after liftoff and uh, the rendezvous process. Uh, you do all your spacewalk uh, as uh, rigorously and uh, as well as you have been trained to do. And uh, at the end of the mission, you have a telescope working perfectly, and that's very, very satisfying. 
I remember very well this release of Hubble at the end of this mission. We we're so happy that the telescope was working again. It was able again to point toward a celestial object. It was Christmas Day, so we, we took this nice picture of the crew. We had Santa Claus hats uh, in a drawer uh, <clears throat> in the, in the mid-deck, and we took this uh, nice uh, Christmas crew picture, STS-61, the third servicing mission of Hubble. Now, I'm not going to do a full course in astronomy, but I want to show you the kind of objects that are being studied with uh, Hubble very briefly. Astronomy course in the 13 Hubble pictures. We have galaxies, clusters of galaxies, globular clusters, which are a uh, very tight uh, concentration of stars, typically of the order of one million stars uh, that are in a halo around uh, the center of, um, of our galaxy, at least, but also of other galaxies. Uh, we look in detail at gas nebula. This is, these are birthplaces for new stars. It's so-called Eagle Nebula, a very famous picture taken by Hubble, very precise. Planetary nebula, which are the end phases of the evolution of stars. Uh, we have pictures of planets. This is Saturn and Mars and uh, comets here. Of course, uh, we could talk a lot about uh, the astronomy done by Hubble, but it's extremely valuable for the science of uh, astrophysics because of the very, very high resolution that uh, we can obtain with a, with a telescope. Very, very fine pictures. We can get pictures of very far away object. That's a typical picture taken by Hubble. We can expose small windows in the sky that are basically void of anything or very few objects. And after hours of exposure or days of exposure, we have uh, pictures showing galaxies all the way to billions, not millions, but billions of uh, light years away. So the faintest object on this picture, uh, we see them as they were uh, billions of years in the past. Uh, on the foreground, you have some stars which are in our galaxy in the forefront. Here also we have some stars, but all the other objects that are a little bit fuzzy, not accompanied by crosses, there are galaxies very, very far away. The faintest being, again, billions of light years away. This is really the legacy of Hubble. This is what Hubble is so good at, pictures of the very far away universe. Now, briefly, at the International Space Station, I mentioned that the shuttle was used to assemble most of the component of the International Space Station. You have an assembly of module, a, a large truss, and a big solar arrays at the end of the truss, which are, during the orbital day, of course, tracking the sun, also tracking during the night, so that in the, in the morning at sunrise, they have the proper orientation. And this is the Russian segment here, and uh, the US segment that we don't see, but uh, in the front of the station, it's moving inside your screen. Uh, you have a Columbus European module and a Japanese Kibo module, and that's a, a Canadian robotic arm. International Space Station, it uh, has been occupied for 20 years since uh, the beginning of the century by crews. Normally you have six people on board, six to seven people on board. And uh, it's been a very efficient uh, laboratory in the uh, on orbit around the Earth for mainly experiments in uh, weightlessness, uh, including uh, the growth of vegetation in weightlessness, study of materials in weightlessness, fluid physics, earth observation, and astrophysics. And uh, <clears throat> there are a, a grand total of five space agencies contributing to this program. You have the uh, US Space Agency, NASA, Roscosmos from Russia, the Canadian Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, and the European Space Agency. And within ESA, we have 11 member states uh, have ESA contributing. And uh, that's a nice picture of a meal taken on board the station with each of the space agencies represented. That's uh, a Canadian astronaut, that's Frank de Wiener from Belgium representing ESA, that's Gennady Padalka from Russia. Uh, that, that's an American astronaut, that's a Japanese Koichi Wakata. That's another uh, Russian cosmonaut. So, uh, they are working pretty much autonomously, the Russians and the uh, Europeans and Americans and Japanese, but uh, they take very often meals together like you see here. This is the speed limit here, by the way, 28,000 kilometers an hour. Now, of course, uh, there are new things happening with the International Space Station very recently. Uh, after the, uh, the shuttle uh, stopped being operated in, in, excuse me, in 2011, the Americans had no way to bring people to the International Space Station, and they had to rely on the 
Russian Soyuz uh, to take their cosmonaut and also European, Canadian and Japanese to the International Space Station. But uh, NASA decided to uh, mandate commercial companies, uh, specifically SpaceX and Boeing, uh, to develop and uh, operate uh, space capsules, you see here, SpaceX space capsule, um, to bring freight on one hand, cargo, and also people to the International Space Station. SpaceX has done it with a Falcon 9 rocket, which is a SpaceX, so private company rocket, and uh, the Dragon has uh, brought freight and cargo and equipment to the ISS since many years. But for the first time this spring, uh, they operated the so-called Crew Dragon, and the test flight was done in the spring of this year, taking two astronauts to ISS inside the Crew Dragon. And more recently, that was the 15th of November, about uh, a month ago, we had the first operational flight of uh, the Crew Dragon with four astronauts that were brought uh, to ISS, four Americans and uh, one Japanese. So that's a, that's a new, new wave of significant contribution of private companies, which is not a competition to NASA. That's something that NASA wanted. They wanted to have transportation of equipment and crews from US soil done uh, by private companies. And uh, <laughs> that, this is the crew for this uh, first operational flight of the Crew Dragon, uh, one American uh, uh, woman, two American men. This, this is a, this is a commander and co-pilot, and these were participants in a way, and that's a Japanese uh, astronaut here. And um, <clears throat> that's a, a video of the liftoff of uh, Falcon 9 on this mission with the Crew Dragon on top for this first operational flight. And that's a short video that I'm going to start. Here we go. And uh, SpaceX had brought something very remarkable. Uh, you see, this is a two-stage rocket, that's the uh, second stage, that's the first stage. And after separation of the first stage, let's say about three minutes after liftoff, uh, SpaceX is able now to recover the first stage. It's, uh, it's equipped with rocket that uh, change its orientation and either bring it back to the launch site or on a, on a barge uh, over the Atlantic Ocean. That's a liftoff from a Kennedy Space Center of Florida going to the east. So the ascent is over the Atlantic Ocean. After separation of the first stage, it comes back uh, most of the time to a small platform uh, on a boat in the Atlantic Ocean. And that's the next video that you will see. That's the recovery of the first stage uh, of any Falcon 9 uh, liftoff, whether it's uh, to take a satellite or the Dragon capsule or the Crew Dragon. That's pretty amazing. Look at that. The motion is, uh, is slowed down with the rocket and then it comes on that barge and uh, it's a soft lift off. And of course, it means that the first stage can be reused over and over again. We have had first stages of a Falcon 9 that have been reused nearly 10 times. And that's a huge saving. And that goes really in the, uh, in the direction of reducing the price of every kilogram brought to low Earth orbit. The price was about uh, close to $10,000 uh, for each kilogram brought to low Earth orbit with the shuttle. Now we are down to about uh, $500 up to $1,000, but uh, less than uh, one-tenth of the price that we had on the space shuttle. Now, of course, the uh, Crew Dragon is a very high technology. <laughs> I showed the pictures of the space shuttle before. And uh, the way to fly the Crew Dragon is with a touch screen, pretty much like you do your, your iPhone or your smartphone or your, your iPad. And of course, uh, private companies brought very fancy uh, spacesuits. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's uh, a different environment uh, from a technical point of view and also from the uh, crew suit point of view than we had with the space shuttle. And uh, I was there uh, at five o'clock in the morning on the 16th of November, November when uh, the uh, Crew Dragon docked with the International Space Station. And uh, I took this picture with my iPhone as I was watching this approach that was transmitted real time 
uh, to the ground. And you see the commander on the left-hand side and the pilot, they have their hands uh, off. They are not doing anything because it's all automatic. They are ready to intervene using the touch screen in case it's needed. But you see the, the, the uh, unbelievable uh, <coughs> technology improvement that we have had uh, uh, between the shuttle and, and the Crew Dragon. Uh, that, that's quite remarkable. What uh, SpaceX has achieved as a private company with a lot of uh, uh, help from NASA, it is true, but it's a really remarkable achievement. Now, this is the Crew Dragon that has uh, docked on the forward portion of the International Space Station. I showed a picture before of the ISS seen from the back, which would be from far on the left-hand side. Uh, the, the back have the uh, Russian segment, then you have the US segment, and this is the Columbus uh, European Laboratory. On the other side, you have the Japanese laboratory. This is so-called Node 2. And uh, the space shuttle in the past was always docking uh, in front of Node 2, and uh, the new US vehicle, the Crew Dragon, is docking at the same location. Now, <laughs> Um, this is a plan. I'm not going to go into the de detail of this. This is very interesting. It's published on Twitter uh, about once a month. And uh, this, this is a date here. And these are all the flights planned to the International Space Station, plus some other uh, human space flight uh, here. And uh, that's the date. We are beginning of December. And uh, uh, you see, we have had uh, this flight. This is the uh, SpaceX. Uh, capsule, the Crew Dragon, and we have had 15th of November, uh, these four American plus the Japanese that went to the station, and they are going to stay about six months, that's the duration of their stay, until about May of 2021. And the next flight of the Crew Dragon, which you see here, is going to be with four American and uh, uh, Thomas Pesquet from France, representing the European Space Agency. In the meanwhile, you have a Soyuz vehicle that will take uh, three cosmonauts to ISS, and two of these will stay for one full year. And uh, that's another Crew Dragon that will take three Americans and uh, Matthias Maurer from the European Space Agency, German. And what is interesting here, that's completely new. These flights are flights uh, with a SpaceX capsule with one SpaceX pilot and three tourists. And here the tourist is Tom Cruise. And uh, there is a film director, and there is a fourth person here from Israel, it looks like. And these are flying with tourists also. So in the future, starting in the middle of 2021, 2022 and beyond, you have a lot of flight with tourists. That's a new opening of a space for, uh, on one hand, commercial astronauts. The traditional space agency astronaut will still, still be going there, of course. Commercial astronauts typically uh, the commander of this uh, flight will be a SpaceX astronaut, not a NASA astronaut, and then you have tourists. So you have three categories, a space agency astronaut, commercial astronaut, and tourists in the future. There's a lot of other information here. By the way, you have here the Artemis flight, preparation of flight to the moon, that's going to be the first flight of the SLS rocket that I will talk about later, uh, which is going to be unmanned. That's going to be the first manned flight in the middle of a 2023, the first manned flight to the moon, but pretty much like Apollo 8, uh, going to the moon, but without landing. The first landing will be in 2024. A lot of information here, very interesting, but I have to, to move on. Um, <clears throat> more and more commercial activities. This is the uh, existing part of the International Space Station on the, on the right-hand side. And here, these are modules that will be added with a company that is called Axiom. Axiom. That's a private company that will, uh, in the future, commercialize the activities on the International Space Station. They will add modules uh, that will allow, on one hand, private activities and commercial activities. And there will be a big room here with large windows, which will be like the cupola of the International Space Station, but much bigger, that will allow the occupants of the Axiom module of the International Space Station to have a beautiful view of the Earth. So that's a commercial, commercialization of space activities attached to the International Space Station. It's, at some point, uh, Axiom plans to detach their module from ISS and have their own commercial private space station independently of ISS. 
Okay, very rapidly, there are so many things uh, to talk about, but I'll say very rapidly something about space debris. One of the big problems in space that we have a lot of debris, not as much as you see here, or as you see on the gravity movie, for instance, with these debris destroying nearly everything, uh, but we have space debris, and uh, the plan is to go and uh, clean up space, and there is a company in Switzerland called Clear Space that uh, has been mandated by ESA to go and pick up a pretty large debris, which is a upper stage of the Vega rocket. And that should happen in 2025. Clear Space One mission will go and grab that piece of debris and deorbit it. Um, the idea is to go and deorbit the big debris one after the other over the next few years and the uh, next few decades because too many big debris in space means collisions and creation of many more small debris. We cannot remove every debris that exists in space. There are about 20,000 of them between uh, 200 kilometers, which is the lowest altitude for being on orbit around the Earth, up to 2,000 kilometers. That's called low Earth orbit area. But uh, the idea is to go and remove the big debris, clean up space. Back to the moon. Yes, uh, that's a program that has been launched very recently from the United States after, uh, <clears throat> you know, the last uh, of the Apollo program flight, uh, Apollo 17, in December 1972. Nobody has gone beyond low Earth orbit, but the plan now, and it's uh, really pushed by Americans to go back to the moon. It's called the Artemis program. And uh, the original plan is to bring two American astronauts, one woman and one man, on the south pole of the moon, 2024. Uh, probably a little later, the program will slip a little bit, 2025 or maybe even beyond. And uh, of course, uh, NASA has to develop uh, a new rocket, pretty much like the Saturn V. It's called the SLS, uh, Space Launch System rocket. Uh, using some of the elements of the shuttle, like the solid rocket boosters and uh, the four hydrogen engine you see in the bottom here will be similar to the space shuttle main engines. And on top you have a capsule, which is called the Orion capsule, which is US developed, but uh, the service module with the uh, electrical power generation, the solar array, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, thermal, thermal control and the reserve of uh, oxygen, uh, will be in the service module provided by the European Space Agency. So that's a joint cooperation between NASA and the European Space Agency. And um, <laughs> that's a nice view of an uh, artist view of uh, the Orion capsule with the NASA component, the ESA component, the solar rays on orbit around the moon with the Earth at the horizon. And uh, why the South Pole? The reason is the following. The moon rotates around itself versus the sun in 28 days. So if you are anywhere in a medium latitude or close to the equator, you have one day on the moon with the sun above the horizon that will last two weeks. And that's uh, not comfortable, it's very hot. And uh, the, the worst is really the night on the moon if you are on medium latitude or close to the equator, which is uh, two weeks. And two weeks in darkness becomes very, 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 very cold. And that's the main problem. But if you are at one of the poles, and preferably the South Pole, because there are many more craters, when you are at the rim of a, of a crater, you can have uh, sun, sunlight all the time. And that's the reason why the target is now to bring the Artemis crews to the South Pole and have eventually a, um, a moon village, uh, which may be directed by the European Space Agency near the South Pole. The idea being, to be able to get the sun whenever you want. If you want to be in the shadow, you can just go down the crater. But if you are at the rim of the crater, you can be in the sun. And there's ice also, and Hergé uh, already found that out. <laughs> That's taken from On a marché sur la lune, Tintin sliding with his uh, spacesuit on a, on a bed of, uh, of ice. There is ice uh, inside craters, which are always in the shadow on the, in the south pole of the moon. This has been detected by the moon reconnaissance orbiter. That's another reason why it's good to go there, because in the Sea of Tranquility, where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed, there is no ice, obviously. Uh, there is a constant sun for two weeks and then shadow two weeks, but the sun could not survive that. But inside shadowed area of uh, craters in the south pole, there is ice, and that's obviously very useful 
you can get oxygen out of these eyes, you can get water and that's useful for uh, maintaining life. Now, of course, uh, private companies are again uh, pretty much engaged in this uh, Artemis program and you have different lunar modules that are in competition with private companies in the US. And uh, <laughs> Toyota uh, is going to provide the Japanese uh, components uh, of the Artemis program. They provide a, a, a lunar vehicle for uh, crews and equipment, pressurized, of course, uh, that will allow displacement of the surface of the moon in the vicinity of the South Pole. Now, the final goal is, is human space flight beyond the moon is to go to Mars. Uh, it's possible to go to Mars. It would be possible to go these days. Uh, at least the flight would be possible. Uh, to live uh, for quite a long time on the surface of Mars is another problem. We need to, we need to solve uh, this problem. We are not ready for that now. But as far as the trip is concerned, it just would be a very long trip, about uh, eight, eight months uh, duration. Um, but uh, the goal has been clearly expressed by uh, NASA. They want to go to the back to the moon. It's back to the moon for them. It's to the moon for the Europeans, the Japanese, and the Canadians. But with the goal of getting ready to go to Mars in the next few decades, probably in the 30s or 40s of this century. Now, uh, I come to <laughs> this uh, very special individual, Elon Musk, a very talented uh, and a powerful entrepreneur, the CEO of uh, SpaceX. I already mentioned uh, the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon, the Crew Dragon, serving the needs of NASA. But he has his own idea. He thinks that humanity should become a multi-planet species, should spread over the whole solar system. And he has developed a rocket called the uh, Starship that should eventually, when it's fully developed and tested, allow him to bring a lot of people to the moon and to Mars. Uh, and that's an artist's view of a, a human station on the surface of Mars. It's Mars and not the moon because there's an atmosphere. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, but it has an atmosphere unlike the moon. And you see two starships here uh, that have just landed. Uh, the idea is to have a fully re reusable Starship. Falcon 9 is partly reusable, only the first stage, but uh, Fal the Starship should be fully reusable. And uh, uh, what is remarkable is that two days ago, on Wednesday of this week, we had a test of the Starship built by SpaceX and independently of uh, their mandate to NASA that a pure Star, uh, uh, SpaceX development, and that the upper stage of the Starship being tested in Boca Chica in South Texas, which is uh, the building area and test area for uh, the Starship. And for the first time, they did already some hops that were low altitude hops, but for the first time, um, Elon Musk and his engineers wanted to do a high altitude test of the Starship. It went pretty well until the last moment you will see. But the idea of the Starship is to go up like this and then when the engine shut down, it will glide down. You see it has wings in the front and the back, it glides down. And at the last moment, it does a flip over maneuver, pitch up maneuver and should land vertically pretty much like the first stage of a Falcon 9 as you have seen landing on this barge in the Atlantic Ocean. So let's look at this movie. This is a really remarkable video that was taken two days ago. I, I took it out of Twitter and I got to show it to you. Be ready, that's really amazing. It's lifting off, and that's a view from a camera on the rocket itself. And these are the three engines, which are um, three rocket engines. All teams, three, three alarms. It's using methane as a propellant, methane and liquid oxygen. You see these three engines lifting off the second stage of the Starship. That's a view from the rocket itself. You see Boca Chica here. You'll see the uh, Gulf of Mexico in a minute here. Yeah. At the Gulf of Mexico. Going up is only about uh, 40 seconds. The total duration of the flight was about six minutes. You see the Gulf of Mexico here also in the back. Okay, now the engine shut down. Then there's a, a pitch maneuver commanded by rockets on the side of, of uh, the Starship. Then it will take a horizontal, pretty much horizontal position. It will glide down to the landing point. And that's quite an achievement. This is really remarkable. And that's two days ago. 
South Texas. Look at that. It's pretty stable, of course. It, it doesn't have a very good lift to drag ratio, obviously. You don't want to do a glider championship with this. Uh, the lift to drag ratio must be about uh, one, two, three, or four. <laughs> but it's gliding. And then the last, last, he, he does this maneuver in order to to land vertically, like the first stage of the Factor 9. But here, something didn't work because it comes too fast. And then it, it destroyed. OK, so that was a bad end. But in fact, it was still a very Elon Musk was very satisfied because the whole, apart from the final landing, the whole rest of the flight was successful. And I took out of Twitter also the next video where you see somebody very exciting describing these, uh, this final uh, approach of a Starship to the landing site and the, the, the final uh, catastrophe. Look at that. Okay, here. Yeah. The site again. That's a commentator here on, on a, Guys, on a terrace is, close to the... To this the is actually looking like it's working. And that's really amazing. That's a, that's a first, a rocket no coming down this way. freaking way. Okay, here we go. Relight. Yes. No way. No way. Oh, my God. Oh. They lost an engine. Oh. Run. No, they lost an engine right at the end. Oh, yes. Woo. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, let's calm down. <laughs> but I think these are nice videos. Just a remark, Elon Musk Starship is not the first reusable rocket in history because the rocket of Tintin, Milou, Capitaine Haddock, Le Les Frères Dupont, uh, 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 Tournesol, designed by Tournesol, was also a reusable rocket. It was even a nuclear-powered rocket. On a marché sur la Lune, 1954. All right, I uh, talked a lot about the uh, space exploration and the uh, great adventure in space, but uh, we need to continue going to space. It's a wonderful adventure and uh, the, 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 the inspiration, the, uh, the discoveries we do are absolutely remarkable. And from a technical point of view, it's very challenging and very interesting, but we should never forget to take care of planet Earth because most of us will stay here. Thanks for your attention. I finished. Thank you, thank you very I'm much. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Claude, uh, um, I, uh, 